Excellent. Thank you all for joining us today for digital education and health and innovative ways of using digital learning in healthcare and the healthcare sector. Um, so just to let you know, before I introduce our panelists, we'll have time for Q&A at the end. We'll have 20 minutes. Um, unfortunately, one of our panelists, Jinka, cannot um, attend the questions. So feel free to send them through us and we can answer them for you. Um, anyways, just to check, everyone can see my slides on the screen. Now we can. Perfect. Um, OK. So to introduce our panelists, so we have Yinka McKinney from Head of Education, NHSX. We have Henri uh, Henrietta Ambia Bankus from Head of Blended Learning and Digital Literacy from Health Education England. We have Dr. Chris Christel, an anesthetist from Cambridge University Hospitals and Health Education England Education Fellow. And then myself, Deborah Gerritsen, I'm the Director of Accounts for Panopto. So before I hand this over to Yinka, I'm just going to go through just a brief overview of Panopto. Sorry if you are familiar with us. Uh, and then the top use cases for uh, medical professionals. Perfect. So first of all, um, Panopto, we serve almost 10 million end users across the globe. That includes 22 of the top 25 universities in the world, such as Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, and Yale. Um, we also work with large multinationals, such as Google and Nike. I am based in our London office, so I'm here to serve all of our European customers. So what is Panopto? So Panopto in a nutshell is a searchable video portal for all your organization's videos, as well as an easy way to record and live stream all of your content. So that's kind of an easy way to look at Panopto um, in just a few words. Now, I will go into a little bit more detail of Okay, well, what else does Panopto do? Why are we market leaders? Well, we're super easy to use. You can make professional quality content with very, very little work. So with Panopto, you can basically record from any device, anywhere, at any time. We will capture all of the feeds. So I'm using this example here from Dr. Martin Kachar from the University of Wolverhampton, where he has three different camera feeds, and you see it's not a complex setup. So basically, you use your most people use their PC, their laptop, whatever you can connect to it. So if it's multiple cameras, slides, maybe you were showing your screen, all of that will synchronize into one viewing experience. And then that comes with automatic um, table of contents, automatic captioning, which is really helpful. Um, you'll get um, also discussions, notes, bookmarks, a lot of social features like that. Oops, I think um, someone's not muted. Um, don't worry. Um, anyway, so that's just an example there. And then also just to touch on the video library aspect. So with Panopto, you have unlimited storage. So you have a complete searchable library. So that's not just the title. That's anything spoken, anything written on the slides, captured on your screen in any way is all time stamped and searchable. So you can truly find what you're looking for. Great. So now that leads me into the top use cases. Um, I have to always like to share the recent research. So this was published in October 2020. The new research will be out in October 2021. But I always ask our community, and this is based on um, the Panopto EMEA region, um, what are the top use cases for Panopto for that year? 23 were submitted. I only show the top 10. Um, so you can see um, lecture capture. We won't go into that. That's been the number one for the past nine years. But now we also have distance learning. We have how-to videos or video tutorials. We have flipped classrooms, so you like your micro lectures. We have staff training and staff self-reflection. We have webcasting events and or courses. We have your VCMS, so your video content management system. So that's kind of your secure searchable library. We have student recordings. We have captioning. And lastly, recorded feedback to students. So these were the top 10, um, which I thought were quite relevant due to obviously COVID. So some of the, so, so quite a few new ones made it to the top 10. Um, great. So now that leads me into what are the top use cases for medical professionals? And so I just picked out a handful that I feel were the top ones that were being used. But before I go into that, I wanted just to share this little interesting bit of data here. So two and three physicians use online video to stay abreast of the latest clinical information. Uh, and they spend around 11 hours per week um, learning new content. So this is really important. So this was this study was done a few years ago. So I would imagine this has actually increased to how much time medical professionals spend um, learning and watching video content. Great. So let's look at the first one here. <clears throat> 
So we have video in learning. So this is one of the top use cases for medical professionals. Um, this is an obvious one because medical professionals do have erratic schedules. So on demand is way better than trying to schedule a face-to-face -face meeting or even scheduling the remote training session. It's much easier to view content on demand. So a lot of medical professionals are using Panopto to help keep physicians and staff up to date with the latest information, methods, and practices as well. And so they're doing this by um, recording courses for e-learning, patient simulation, healthcare compliance training um, videos, and more. So that's kind of um, what's happening in video there. Um, next, we have to improve patient education with on-demand video. So this is one of the top use cases, which I think became really popular because with Panopto, it's very easy to create professional quality content. So there's no real um, barrier to entry there for healthcare professionals to use video more freely. And so we've seen um, our medical customers provide guidance on disease prevention, medical procedures, and chronic condition management. And we've noticed that they feel that this promotes active patient participation and treatment decisions while saving the physician time associated with like individual counseling. Okay. Uh, the next one I want to cover is to maintain a central secure video library. And I could say without a doubt, especially for the NHS, this has been the most popular um, use case. And I will say globally. Um, so basically, Panopto is a secure searchable central library for all your organizational knowledge. This has become increasingly important, especially during COVID, where there's so many different ways to record, store, and share your content that we've noticed a lot of organizations, a lot of um, universities are just like, where do we, where's that one central spot where all of our um, video needs? And it's been Panopto due to the unlimited storage and the way it's searchable. So with Panopto, all content created in or uploaded to Panopto automatically indexes and timestamps all written spoken content. So you don't always have to go, where is this located in a folder or course? You can literally just type in a keyword. So maybe you wanted to see the latest COVID compliance video for your hospital. You can literally type in those keywords and you can find that exact video, whether it was in the title or spoken. Um, also, people often like to subscribe to specific folders or tags to stay up to date with the most recent information and news. Okay, so last, we're going to look at broadcast public events, presentations, and announcement. And actually, this is kind of funny. This was actually the first use case, our first NHS customer. This was their first use case many, many years ago. Um, but it's still a very popular use case now. So with Panopto, you can securely and easily live stream press conferences, presentations, and events to thousands of simultaneous users across the globe. And so that was the main question was, how many concurrent users? Well, there's, there's no limit. I think the largest one I've been a part of was 10,000, but it's technically as many as you as many as you want. Um, and so some of the use cases we've seen from medical professionals are webcasting, opening of new facilities, promoting new hospital treatments and programs, programs, and publishing their most latest research. Um, perfect. So that's it from me. I'm going to hand over to Yinka now to take us forward. Thanks, Deborah. I'm just going to take over the slides. Thanks. Okay, um, thank you for inviting me to speak. So my name is Yinka. I'm Head of Innovation at NHSX. I've been there just a few months, um, but was also very much involved in uh, NHSX's response to the COVID-19 crisis. So I'm just gonna give you an overview of what we've been doing. Uh, oops, sorry. Okay, so um, just for those of you who aren't aware of who we are, we are a relatively new unit um, which combines uh, NHS England, NHS Improvement and the Department for Health and Social Care colleagues together. We are a policy and strategy team um, and our focus is really um, sort of developing policy to support digital transformation across the health and care sector but also um, the strategy uh, to implement it as well. Um, and we were still very new before when the COVID crisis hit. And, and so a lot of our work has been greatly accelerated over the last few months. Um, what we really wanted to do this time last year was to be able to support our colleagues in the health and care system rise to the challenge that was COVID-19. And, and therefore, a lot of things, as many of you would have experienced, were vastly accelerated. Some of the things that we were able to do um, were we were able to provide hardware, software, simpler procurement channels, um, much simpler information governance advice, 
to our colleagues so that they can actually execute some of the things that were being asked of them quicker. This slide just shows um, a few of the things that we achieved. Um, I just want to focus on one or two of them. So, so online consultations and virtual consultations was already a program that we were rolling out before March last year. Um, and we were definitely getting there, but we didn't have wall to wall coverage. Obviously, that was something that um, really picked up uh, sort of over the, the first, I guess, the first few months of the COVID crisis. Um, the other thing that we saw was um, uh, our G GP Connect, which is a sort of a mechanism of um, a summary of the GP record for a patient being uh, available to, to view and read only by 111 online services or other GP practices. It also allows appointment booking and in the future will allow um, a summary of a consultation to be to be posted. That was greatly accelerated as well. And in fact, it was it was it went live, but it also we, we also saw um, the uptake of that um, significantly increase. Um, what I really want to talk to you about today, though, was some of the work that was started last year, but continues to grow this year. Um, and that is remote monitoring. Uh, remote monitoring before uh, March last year was was very, very early stage, very patchy. Only a few areas had even explored it, really, in this country. Um, and uh, we were approached by a number of small number of sites, both in the acute sector and in primary care, who were really desperately looking for solutions that could support them with uh, managing their COVID patients remotely. So in particular, they were looking at uh, solutions that for patients who had been discharged from hospital uh, with COVID, but were fit enough to, to be at home, uh, but they still needed to have their symptoms monitored and the oxygen saturation levels monitored. So we were very, um, we were able to identify some solutions to for that particular use case. And we rolled out at pace within three or four weeks, something which would have taken a year normally, uh, remote monitoring solutions to, to solve those particular challenges, both in primary care and in secondary care. Now, um, it was a combination of, of platforms, but also we focused very much on um, the implementation approach as well, so that we could get the maximum amount of adoption of that intervention. Um, uh, we evaluated the intervention and we actually generated some very positive results. Um, whilst whilst the, sort of the, um, the patient size was relatively small, what we were seeing was uh, impact on clinician time. So it was reducing, it was freeing up time for the clinicians actually, so that they could better prioritise who they needed to see urgently based on the readings that were coming through to them uh, in real time. Um, and actually, the level of experience was positive from both the patients and the clinicians. Patients actually felt reassured. So even though they weren't seeing their clinician face to face regularly, the fact that they got a notification, a very uh, um, sort of uh, a notification, very much like WhatsApp notifications, which which gave them the reassurance that their readings had been read by a clinician but that they didn't need to take any action. That was vastly um, helpful for the patient and it made them feel like they were still being cared for. So we took those learnings from that very early piece of work that we did last year and decided to really accelerate it and scale it. Um, and really the benefits of remote monitoring, many of you will, will sort of, um, we are already starting to warm to this, is that Remote monitoring or remote care in general, not just remote monitoring, helps us to move from a model which we currently have, which is very much planned and elective care focused, very much focused on booking appointments in advance. Um, often there are long waiting lists for appointments. And, and obviously what we've seen in the last year is that that sort of model is highly susceptible to um, sort of uh, situations beyond our control where we have to close down GP practices because we need to maintain certain 
uh, restrictions. So we want to move to a model which is more proactive care focus, where uh, monitoring can be done more on a continuous basis. Patients are more in control and empowered to be a, an active participant in their own care. And actually they can learn more about managing themselves. And also clinicians can better prioritize which patients they need to spend more time with versus other ones. So that's the model we're working towards. Um, so we have this year um, initiated a program which is focused, it's called a scale plan, uh, uh, which is effectively uh, supporting regions and their ICSs and CCGs to roll out at scale remote care uh, interventions. And uh, what we've done is we've given all the regions a certain amount of money. We've invested in software licenses on a one off basis. Um, and we have set up something called an innovation collaborative, which facilitates learning between all of the sites that are trying to implement these solutions and pathways. Um, and this slide is just to, to give you a flavor of the ver variety of initiatives which are happening across the country but are all sort of based on remote care models. And they span cardiology, uh, sort of asthma. We've got quite a few that are focused in, so in social care and care homes environment as well, which we're really delighted about. Um, and we've got ambitious plans. So uh, we've got an ambitious plan. Um, the one million is indicative, so please don't, um, sort of quote that, but uh, we have an ambitious plan to reach as many patients as possible across the health and care system um, this finan next financial year that, that's going to start in a week's time. Um, and that's through the scale plan, which I've just uh, sort of outlined to you. We're, we've also prioritised some specific care pathways. So there's a lot of work going on around hypertension at the moment. That's one that I'm leading. In fact, so we're rolling out uh, blood pressure monitors and we are working with uh, ICSs to stand up a uh, remote monitoring pathway to support patients with poorly controlled blood pressure. We've got a big program of work which is focused on ophthalmology, um, both in terms of triage, improving triage, but also engaging high street optometrists into uh, the pathway and supporting them with advice and guidance and linking them up with specialists. And we're doing some work around respiratory disease, heart failure, uh, teledermatology um, and other pathways. So um, we're really prioritizing how can we transform some of these pathways, um, recognizing that, that it's not digital by, it can't be digital by default but digital plays a, a, you know, a massive role in uh, supporting particular use cases, certain patient cohorts uh, to, to the sort of execute um, uh, certain aspects of the pathway. Um, all of this is underpinned by uh, a piece of work that we're doing around standards. Um, so we're trying to, to identify better ways of connecting all of this data up. Um, and the other piece of work that we're doing, which provides some of the infrastructure, is we've just launched something called DTAC, which is a new um, assessment framework for digital solutions to ensure that they stand up to scrutiny uh, with respect to clinical safety, usability, uh, data security, privacy, etc. Um, so solutions that we'll be working with and that we'll be recommending will have to go through that process. Um, and just to, just to finish off, um, so what we aim to what we aim to sort of generate from all this work that we're doing, particularly around the pathway transformation using digital platforms, is that we want to be able to publish a number of playbooks that then uh, provide our colleagues in the system with tangible, practical uh, um, guidance around how to do this. It's remote monitoring, if I can use that as an example, is has many aspects to it that that we need to get right in order for us to be able to sort of um, realize the benefits of that kind of intervention. Um, you know, whether it's making sure the workflow has been um, adapted, the workforce model is, is in place. Um, 
looking at how you onboard patients. There's a whole raft of things that we need to get right. And so what we want to do through the work that we're doing now and into the next financial year is solve some of those problems and then be able to publish some guidance that helps um, people in the system to actually implement this um, as seamlessly as possible. And I think I will stop there. Thank you, Inka. Now I wanted to hand this over to Henrietta. Thanks, Deborah. And really good to be following Inka because what she has done is really lay out the foundation for me to carry on from there. So I think rather usefully with any digital um, um, initiative, you need three things to be in place, which is very much the, pe the people, the technology and the process. And what Yinka has really described there is the process and the technology. So I will focus a bit more on the people, which is very much how do we support people to learn and be able to fully utilize these digital technologies? So just I, I find it really useful sometimes to be clear about what what the it is or what we are talking about so digital learning for for us is about you know any instructional practice that effectively uses technology to strengthen a student's learning experience and encompasses a wide spectrum of tools and practices so for, uh, in in the simplest um, format or the benefit of that is really learning facilitated by technology but it gives the student an element of control over time, place, path, or pace. And I think that is really, really important because if you work across health and care, people are usually extremely busy and being able to have that control over, you know, the time, the place, the path, or the pace in which they learn and the variety of learning that's offered to them, I think is really key. So Health Education England offers digital learning through a number of approaches. So starting off, we have, the three main really approaches, and I think there are other approaches within the organization, but the three key ones or programs that we offer digital learning through is our digital readiness program, because all of this is not always just about developing um, capability, but it's also about the culture. So not just the skills, but the culture as well, which we define as digital readiness. And then also through our technology enhanced learning offer, but more recently, blended learning has become an approach that we are really, really keen on to support future um, education of our health workforce. So digital readiness, what are we doing within digital readiness to support um, digi uh, digital learning? Um, so it, it's really about establishing learning and development through a couple of um, work streams. So digital literacy, which I lead on, is very much around how do we develop digital capabilities of everyone within our health and care workforce. And the program looks at a number of approaches, including actually defining what digital literacy is and the fact that it's not just, you know, being social media savvy, but actually looking at it from a number of cap cap capability domains, but also being able to provide learning as and when people need it and at a level that's required um, for them to be able to uh, uh, um, develop those digital skills. So really it is about the digital learning opportunities that we are offering to allow people to, you know, develop their digital skills. And then we've got our digital academy, which is very much around developing digital leadership. So whilst um, previously the leadership was at um, potentially chief information officer level or clinical chief information officer level, the vision for the digital academy is now widening access really. So looking at um, aspiring leaders and be beginning to offer um, you know, open learning opportunities for people to start developing those skills till they get to that higher level of you know, either being a chief information officer or clinical um, chief clinical information officer. Now, everybody likes to be part of a family. So really, we do know that there are, you know, digital professionals within our health and care um, and workforce, but they all call different things with different characteristics. And sometimes actually people literally walk into these roles and we are very, very keen to ensure that actually we bring these groups together 
and think about standards that really support their um, car career paths or their competencies. So our professionalizing um, digital workforce um, work stream really looks at just that. And it's very much working with um, various organizations such as you know, Fed IP and Faculty of Clinical Informatics to ensure that professionalization of our digital workforce. But more importantly as well, in terms of the learning that you know, these specific groups get, sometimes it's about the access. And we do know a lot of our digital offers tend to be for specific groups of people. So professionalizing these groups is not just you know, joining in with these um, professional standards or professional um, um, faculties or groups, but it's also about the networks that we promote and the learning offer that you know, the networks do develop or are offered to be able to really facilitate these um, digital learning offers. And then thinking about our, uh, our future digital workforce, very much around whilst we have got the, the workforce that we have got, we do know that obviously as um, um, things progress and with the amount of digital that we are needing to use within our um, health and care settings, we will need um, various um, digital skills in future to be able to develop that. And we are looking at a number of approaches to, uh, to address that, which is very much looking at graduate schemes, looking at you know, school leavers, um, but also um, digital health fellowships, really to support our clinicians who really are keen on developing um, leadership, digital leadership skills in this space. And again, digital learning offers some real opportunities to that. When we've got all of this in place, I think it, we cannot overemphasize the need around supporting the right culture and environment, because if we set all of this up, but not in the right environment or culture, then it's highly unlikely that we'll be benefiting significantly from it, which is why we offer a board level um, development and awareness for them, uh, for boards to really understand the, how to truly implement digital strategies. So the other approach that we have got certainly within HE is use, I mean, our technology enhanced learning offer, which is very much around, you know, using technology to make learning easier for our health and care staff. And it, it is offered through a number of platforms. So we've got our e-learning for healthcare platform, which was very pivotal in delivering di digital learning through the COVID period, not just in England or in the UK, but worldwide where we have over 22, uh, 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 over 22 million um, um, registrants basically accessing learning. And that could only happen because it's a digital learning offer. We have got our new um, learning hub as well, which is currently again um, in a beta test. And it, not just what we do know from our learning is digital learning is effective some, with peer-to-peer -peer support and peer learning. So the learning hub, which will incorporate the learning from the e-learning for help platform will also facilitate and support the development of networks, communities of practice, and also content from users. And then the third platform, which is our digital learning solutions, is, is one that really hosts, for example, our digital literacy self-assessment diagnostic tool. And it also supports the development or the links to um, competency frameworks for people to be able to understand where they are at or what's expected of them as a result of their role or their profession and be supported with digital learning. But not just, I think offering digital learning is great, but what we also are keen on doing and is through thought leadership across the, the technology and has learning area. And for that, we are looking at the simulation based education and supporting regional networks but also the use of innovative learning um, technologies, including immersive technologies. So whilst digital learning comes in various formats, I think more and more we are aware that technology is developing at a very fast rate and there are new things coming in regularly that we need to pay attention to if it adds value to learning. Talking about our future workforce, so whilst digital learning or online learning adds real value, we do know from the evidence that actually a blend or a hybrid learning, so 
not just face-to-face -face learning or online learning or digital learning, but a blend usually provides, you know, better outcomes or better um, experience for learners. So within HE, we have got a blended learning program looking at how we can incorporate these approaches to the pre-registration training for all our health professionals. And the aims really is to create an innovative, um, accessible degree program to attract diverse student population. People learn differently and traditionally face-to-face -face learning hasn't always been suitable for everyone, especially when it doesn't provide flexibility and um, uh, flexibility in training. So really what we hope the blended learning approaches will do is provide that flexibility with increased use of digital and other learning technologies, but also create a, a significantly different offer. Certainly we started off with our nursing education that supports a qualitatively different expert who are suited for 21st century care. If you train people with digital, digital becomes a way of being rather than something else that they need to do. So we are really looking as a result of that to develop an evidence-based framework to guide investment, development and delivery of effective blended um, learning health programs, because it's not just having technologies for technology's sake, but making sure that it, it does have the impact for the learner in the way that digital learning offers itself to. So I think I'll end uh, there. We've got um, some resources that participants can look at. And thank you. I'll hand it over to you, Deborah. Thank you so much, Henrietta. That was great. And now last we have Chris. And again, feel free to submit your questions. We'll answer after Chris's presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Deborah. And yeah, I, um, I'm really excited to speak about this topic, mainly because it, it sort of articulates and demonstrates exactly what Henrietta has been talking about is with blended learning. And um, just to give you some context before I launch into a few slides is I'm a doctor within the East of England, a training doctor. So our regional teaching sessions, uh, which we have to go to, who are organised by HEE, happened only from face to face teaching before the COVID the pandemic, uh, which meant that we had to drive miles and miles sometimes over sometimes a couple of hours to get to a hospital pay for parking get lunch get all the speakers involved um and then drive all the way back which was really time consuming and not and, and just to listen to a bunch of lectures that weren't necessarily that interactive so what what we did was just before the pandemic we decided that actually we'll take this blended learning approach and we'll apply it to to all the regional specialties within our within the east of England, so all of the doctor specialties, cardiology, medicine, surgery, anaesthetics, and we'll use a platform um, with with video integration, which is where Panopto came into the whole thing. Um, so let me just quickly show you what how this looks. So this is how it's all structured. So. If we go through this diagram that you can see in the middle, Panopto sort of underpins what our learning management system does for all of our trainees. And essentially, we can provide teaching face to face uh, and record it either using Zoom or actually preferably using Panopto because it's, it's, a, it's a dedicated lecture capture system. We can use a phone to pick up side streams. So if we're doing workshops, we have the speaker talking. And then when we split out into workshops, we just get a couple of um, uh, phones that that are completely uh, fixed on the, the small workshops that are going on. And we can record them. Or we can pre-record lectures that we can play either remotely or, or live if a speaker can't be there because they're in a list or they're in, they're in surgery or whatever they're doing. And essentially we can upload these to this massive cloud-based storage system that Panopto has and open it up to all the specialties within our region. So every time there's a video or every time there's a teaching session that's unrelated to my specialty, I can move into that specialty and show uh, and, and watch it. And this is all underpinned, this is all integrated within Bridge, which is our LMS, which is our learning management system. Yeah. So the learner accesses training either through a live training event that's scheduled in Bridge, which is usually through Zoom or Teams, mainly Teams. And then the recordings are stored in Panopto. Um, and Panopto is, this, and if a trainee couldn't get to that live training session, they go, they log into Panopto and they just watch what they need to watch. And they can log in through their laptop, through their desktop or through their mobile. Uh, equally, those recordings are 
can also be uploaded to the Learning Hub, which is uh, the NHS sort of massive cloud where we can share links to videos within Panopto. Um, and also we can embed those videos into online courses. So there's an absolutely huge body of educational evidence that we have in video that we can now distribute across multiple different platforms and multiple different websites. But the, where it really becomes interesting is now where we can start to blend, if I just go back a step, we can start to blend live training events with online courses with video. And if I just take this learning pathway, for example, and this is where the whole, the the, the, the programming of teaching is, is becoming a bit more professional in the sense that we're talking about making it, um, making it more tailored to the pathway and to the place where people are learning. We can put an online, a couple of online courses within Bridge, and then we can schedule a live event through Zoom, and that can all be, um, that can all be reviewed in Panopto as well. So let me quickly show you how this all works in reality. Uh, so that's just a bunch of. So this is Bridge. If I just show you Bridge here, this is our learning management system. So this is where all the trainees come and log in, and they log in usually come to this this front page and they have a tool section here on the right hand on the left hand side uh, which is where panopto sits so panopto is 100% integrated within our learning management system let's say there's a a, a a webinar going on a trainee will go to the training calendar here and they'll pick up what training day they want to go on so today i was supposed to go to some friday teaching which i missed uh, but on the first of uh, on the 1st of, uh, just after March, well, I'll go to an anesthesia advanced pain day, which hopefully I'll get to. But I've missed this day today. So what I'll do is I'll go to Panopto on the left. And now I log straight in. So it has a single sign on. I don't have to sign in again. It's all integrated. And I can now browse all these folders for what I missed. So all of these folders are now accessible to all of the trainees within our region, which means that if I, uh, uh, I'm interested in just catching up on a bit of intensive care medicine, I can go into the folder and I can pick up where I left off. So I've already started some here. And the great thing about this is that it also shows you how many times people have seen this video. So there's lots of analytics behind it. Equally, if our educators now wanted to create an online course, they can go into the, the, the courses section of Bridge and they can use any of these um they can use any of these videos to integrate into an online course so if i just build a new course quickly i'll show you how panopto can seamlessly integrate into into quickly making educational materials from the get-go and this is where we're trying to upskill our educators who are all mostly doctors and nurses um we're trying to understand how to make digital content very easily very quickly with uh, and without having to sacrifice on quality so uh if i have a five britain from spiel here about um, how amazing the nhs is and then i go into our media section within our lms panopto sits there as an integrated product and it now is going to connect to our cloud so it's going to tell us right Let's go and see what video you want to integrate into this course. And if I go back to my intensive care medicine bit, and I was going to create a course on acute pancreatitis, I can start off with James Varley talking about it. And now we've integrated and embedded a video within this course. And I can pop it out of the, I can pop it out of the window and view it in pure panopto mode. Or I can view it in this sort of very small, sort of pocket-sized podcast view. Uh, there's also a very cool discussion board here where we can comment on things so that we can have discussions that keep on rolling. There's a community uh, that happens. And also, if you comment here, James will get, James Varley will get that uh, question so he can answer it. So you've got direct access to a, a subject matter expert. Equally, the last thing I wanted to show you was the great thing about having technology like this available at your fingertips is that there isn't a barrier to creating anything. So there isn't a barrier to creating content, uh, which is not also this has not necessarily been historically uh, 
the case with the NHS has always been quite difficult, uh, which has been changed since, you know, which is changing since people like Henrietta and Yinke have taken, taken over. And essentially now we can start to record videos within our browser just at the drop of a hat. So if we wanted to, if the, if we wanted to um, communicate a training video very quickly, what we can do is we can, we can suddenly, we can open Panopto, open Panopto capture within the browser, create a video. And then instead of sending a long email about how to do something, you just send someone a link with you showing them how to do it, which also means you don't have to make another meeting. You don't have to sort of hold their hand through it. But if I, these are the training videos we have, and I can just share this video now by just sending someone this link and it will automatically allow them to watch you show them how to do something through technology, uh, which is a huge time saver and massively efficient. Um, and is a new way of communicating over and above words and emails. So I hope that's given you a taste of how we have organized stuff within the East of England. Um, this is this is all also complementing all the work Henriette is doing with blended learning. Uh, and and I hope you found it useful. I'm happy to take any questions that you have and I'll just pass it over to Deborah. Perfect. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, that was very good. Great. So we do have a lot of questions. Um, so I'll start just kind of going through them. I'm just going to start from the top. Top. Oh, oh, actually, Grace Brown just got one right in. Um, so um, Grace asks, uh, my question is that the NHS is at a varying, varying stages of technological readiness. How does NHS X's and HEE's approach allow for this and help to achieve uniformity in readiness for the NHS itself and for trainees and patients who are expected to use tech? So, uh, unfortunately, Inca is not around <laughs> to pick up the NHS. <laughs> part of it in terms of the readiness from the tech uh, the technology tools but i can certainly speak for the the people part of it in terms of the digital readiness so as i outlined we've got a number of initiatives or programs to really think about getting a workforce that's ready so we're looking at this not just from the workforce that we currently have but also the future workforce because until we start addressing the needs for the people in training we'll never get to the point where we have got sufficiently digitally skilled or digitally ready workforce to be able to utilize these technologies so a number of the areas that i did mention was really looking at you know digital literacy for all so every member of our workforce, we have developed a self-assessment diagnostic tool that allows them to assess their digital literacy skills against a number of domains. So, for example, information, data and content, looking at creation, innovation, looking at, um, you know, teaching. And so there are a number of domains that people can assess themselves against. And once they do that, it tells them where they are at and they are offered recommended learning to meet the needs the, the, the needs that they have identified. So we are doing that, but not just that. So whilst everybody's got these skills, we also need to think about profession specific because digital is, is context specific. So what does all of these digital skills mean for the various professions? And then look at it from a leadership perspective as well. So we are doing a number of things. And as I've already mentioned, within our blended learning programs, we are not just looking at how does this actually apply to you know, trainees coming into the system, but also widening access, because we do know there are people living in remote and rural areas who obviously haven't historically maybe been able to access um, um, health professional training programs because of the way that it's, it's been delivered. And using blended learning approaches does not only provide them access, but also supports them in developing their digital literacy skills. So have a look on our website. We've got a number of programs running at the moment to do just that really support the workforce that we have to be digitally ready. Thank you, Henrietta. Um, perfect. Um, so we'll go on to the next one. Um, how easy is it to manage Panopto or the Panopto videos? So I guess, Chris, um, if you wanted to comment or I can comment. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, um, it's really easy. So uh, it's like because you've got so many routes into Panopto, um, it, it, it's really easy 
Yeah, the you can upload video files just directly, so you don't have to use Panopto software. So if you just have any video file, you can just chuck it into. It's essentially a big Dropbox, not to debit, but it's a big video Dropbox that you can just chuck stuff into. Um, but also you can you can shut down folders that you don't necessarily want to be public. So there are there are lots of um, doctors, especially quite a few professors who are very particular about their intellectual property. And we have a specific folder for them that they control the access rights to. So they share the links to those to those videos, um, which gives them which gives them it, it helps them engage with what we're doing because they have control over their content. Um, also, you can edit. So if you upload a video within Panopto, you can edit it directly within the platform. Which means that, you, and it's very simple editing software in terms of it's not supposed to be for Adobe Photoshoppers. It's supposed to be to crop and take out bits that you know there are, the, you know, the bookends where there's a lot of faffing going on, and the breaks. It's very easy to just chop those out, reprocess it, and it's all it's all done. Um, and you can move, you can just drag and drop videos into folders wherever you think is best i would say that you do i would recommend which we probably learned the hard way i would recommend a dedicated it infrastructure uh, within your trust i have a workforce that understands panopto and and uh, and sort of get that architecture and that infrastructure well embedded within your within your organization so that it doesn't always just fall to one person to manage it Oh, very good. Thank you, Chris. Um, perfect. And then the next one we have, oh, where is the data for Panopto stored? How does GDPR apply? Oh, perfect. Um, well, for um, our UK customers, they tend to like to stay on our EU cloud, which is in Ireland, and we are fully GDPR compliant. And next question um, we have, oh, can others use the platform? I'm thinking about PCN. PCNs. Um, so I think that was, I'm not sure if they were referring to Chris, your section, um, but we can maybe just talk about how to access any of the platforms we discussed. Yeah, PCNs. Just, is that um, primary care, primary care network? network. Um, so at the moment for our, for our platform, it's just for secondary care. Um, actually, I lie to you. It's it is very much for the GPs, and it's not just for GPs. It's for uh, the GP physicians associates as well. So uh, it, we've crossed into not out of the doctors world, which we you know for doctors is difficult because um, they're pretty they're pretty set in their ways. But we've gone over to GPs, GP physicians associates, and also we've just. We've just hit a nursing placement to the undergraduate nursing placements for GPs as well, where we coordinate because all of that content, all of that GP content is cross cross pollinated across those sections. So there's a lot of duplication that we've we've um, we've removed by allowing people to share content across the specialties, uh, which is what e for Health does all the time. So, I mean, similarly, you've, you've mentioned e-learning for health. It's, you know, it, it's accessible through registration for any health and care professional. Um, if it's the digital self-assessment diagnostic tool, it's currently in public beta testing. And because we use um, center management for it as a result of managing the data well, if you get in touch, we depending on which organization you are in, we could it's either live in your organization or we could allow you access to test it or when it becomes live in your organization, you could then use it. Excellent. Oh, I think she put a clarification. Um, she puts I'm talking about all the new roles around PCN, especially around frailty. I uh, I'm, I'm probably not the right person to answer that, to be honest. Um, okay, no worries. Apologies, um, I'm sorry. Have a, look, have a look on the digital readiness um, um, website. So it, the links are in the um, on the slide. If you have got specific questions around any of it, please send us an email into our inbox and we do respond rather, I mean, rapidly. So you will get a response either from myself or a member of the team. 
Excellent. Um, so also, I want to go to the bottom because there were some in the beginning. Um, we have, oh, how have you dealt with digital access and literacy, especially in the very elderly? <laughs> really good question. So that, that is a question that keeps coming up. So whilst we have been focused on um, digital literacy for our workforce, very cognizant that all of this will not work without digital literacy within our citizen population. So we haven't directly done a lot of work in this area, but we do know of, you know, other organizations, for example, the Good Things Foundation, who have done extensive work around uh, um, digital citizens. And there is also a digital citizens organizations in Newcastle doing that. So there are various pieces of work that's really beginning to look at what all of this, this means for citizens and patients accessing these digital services. So, uh, yeah, and there's an ex there's an example of um, a very good example of remote um, remote diagnostics using pacemakers and ICD technology where they use Bluetooth connections through their phone, uh, which essentially means for those very frail, it, it, it might not be necessary to upskill them. It's about letting the technology allow them not to have to be skilled in any sort of way for them to get access to care um, and all the hard work's done on the technology side. Um, and there's a balance because that's not always the case. But a, a really good case in point is that ICD technologies uh, and pacemaker technologies that essentially remotely download all your information. The doctor can see all of the recordings uh, from the last however many years. And if there's anything strange or, or there's arrhythmias happening, um, they can give you a ring and they disc discuss it over the phone. And that's just instigated by you walking past a box that's connected to your phone line. So that's a great way of trying to avoid, firstly trying to avoid having to skill people. But if you do need to skill people, it's about skilling them in very discrete areas, I think as well. Excellent. Great. Um, we have a question here as well. Has anyone used chatbot or similar automated triage and artificial intelligent machine learning for delivery, op for delivery opportunity? So the only one that comes to mind straight away is um, Babylon. So I know Babylon, which obviously offers um, primary care services, or GP services, uses chatbot and artificial intelligence for triaging. Okay, excellent. See if there's some new ones in. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, someone asked, how about NHS Wales staff? I think they're talking about perhaps access. Is that access to which platforms? Does it mention? Does it mention if it's if it's Panopto NHS uh, NHS Health Education Improvement Wales has a um, Panopto license which you are absolutely welcome to use. I think they've had it for four or five years, um, so feel free to contact them. I'm not sure if it's regarding the other platforms um, or the other uh, um, ones from Henrietta's presentation. I'm assuming they can also access it. <laughs> yeah, so in, in terms of the other platforms, again, we have got, um, as I mentioned, the e-learning for health platform is accessed not just by England or people in the UK, but internationally as well. And there are arrangements in place with other nations to be able to access the learning, the digital learning on those platforms. So again, you should be able to access it. Excellent. Uh, and then we have another question. How do you monitor your learners, uh, oh, sorry, moved, your learners progression through a blended approach using Panopto in your LMS? Is it completely self-driven or do you have a formative summative assessments built in? Um, so a bit of both. So uh, it, depending on the program, so there are some programs, uh, blended learning programs that are absolutely critical uh, to get right. So that's particularly to do with uh, non, for example, non intensive care doctors or healthcare staff going into a surge COVID unit, they absolutely need to do the blended learning COVID induction program. And we can monitor every single step of that. So we can unlock bits of the blended learning program uh, by their completion. So they've done course one, it will unlock course two and then it will unlock a face-to-face -face or webinar event 
we can check we can check that they've they've done that through the LMS, but also the uh, Panopto's um, Panopto's analytics linked to our LMS as well. So it's all sort of centralized in one place. Um, so that's very useful. But there are other programs where we just allow people to explore and enroll whenever you need to. Uh, otherwise, it all becomes a bit too prescriptive and not about letting people you know, uh, sort of satisfy their curiosity. Um, so we mix it up, but there's an ability to do that, absolutely. Excellent. Okay, um, we have a next question. Um, oh, in respect with um, palliative care services, how effective will we be able to monitor our patients in hospice care and nursing homes? That's probably one for Yinka. Yeah, I think, yeah. There's been a lot for Yinka. I'm so sorry, Yinka had to leave early. She had another, uh, I think, another webinar. Um, but um, I'm sure we. Um, her slides are here and probably her contact details if you have questions. Let's find another one here. Oh, uh, is the system is the system used in Northern Ireland? Not sure which system. Um. <laughs> Again, if it's our learning system, as I said, it's open to all all the four nations. So yeah, it, it, you should be able to access it. And if not, send us an email and let's have the because. For our self-assessment diagnostic tool, we are in conversations with the other four nations to open up access and they will start testing with their own equivalent health education. So health improvement, Wales and, and Scottish one and Northern Ireland. So they will do the test before they put it out in the system, but definitely with e-learning for health, yes. Excellent. Um, for Panopto, I do not believe we are in Northern Ireland. Um, however, just to, so you know, if you do want to use Panopto, we work with, like I said, in the UK, over almost 85% of all UK universities. So I've noticed a lot of the hospitals trusts are linked to um, universities, so you can probably use theirs. Um, so feel free to do so. Next question. Um, oh, um, how do you see digital learning and hands-on experiences being joined together? Well, so that, that that's where I think for me, blended learning is key. So while you know, digital learning historically has been kept separately or looking at distance learning, we are very keen to have a blend because the evidence is there and you know, the peer-to-peer -peer for learning, the face-to-face, -face, I think for um, health professional education and training, a real blend or a true blend does offer real value. So apart from the value that it offers, I think people learn differently using a mixture of approaches does mean that you will reach a wider audience than just using you know digit, just online digital learning or just face to face so certainly that's where we're going yeah and i i completely agree with that Henrietta. and i think um just to riff off that which is that i think what we shouldn't be getting rid of face-to-face -face teaching i think yeah. i think Online learning allows us to use the sort of flipped classroom model a lot more so that people can do people can do a lot of their reading online rather than having a subject matter expert tell them a bunch of facts. And what we use the face to face time for, be it uh, uh, actual face to face when we're allowed or online face to face uh, is for the experiential learning sections of, of using subject matter experts to, to, to tell you the stuff in between the facts, the gray bits that not everyone can really articulate on an online course, right? Or in a video. Um, and it's also being allowed to have those little workshops that allow people to have discussions and debates about what evidence means what. Uh, there's not always, just because a, a paper says something is statistically significant doesn't mean it's always the right thing to do uh, because the paper itself might be flawed and you need to be able to read that and uh, appraise that but equally i think where you blend uh, one of the first ways of online learning that was really effective was eals where most of the online stuff was done through uh, a very simple sort of online course and then you spent one day doing the practical stuff, uh, which is especially good for simulation because everyone's gripe about simulation when they go and do a simulation course face-to-face -face is that they don't get enough time actually doing a drill or simulating. So you can get all of the like faff, all of the theoretical faff out of the way online, and then you can spend two days just drilling at home with practical procedures and, and drills 
Uh, and that's that's how I see it happening. Yeah. But but also let's remember that actually if it's a, a professional health professional education, then we are bound by regulatory standards in terms of what can or cannot be done in person. So I don't see in-person education or training going anywhere. It, it, there will be some elements of it, but equally, we are more and more learning about the value that, you know, uh, um, emerging technologies and simulation lend to our theoretical and practical learning. Excellent. Well, I think that is all the questions right on time, everyone, like it was planned. I want to thank our panelists again, of course, Jinka, who had to leave early, but also Chris, Henrietta, thank you so much. And thank you all for attending and submitting your questions. If you do have any further questions, I think I think most of our details are linked. You can always, always get in contact with Panopto. But thank you again for everyone's participation. Uh, and big round of applause for the panelists. <laughs> okay, thank you all so much. Thanks, Deborah. Thank Thanks, Henrietta. Nice to meet you all. Take care. Bye. Bye.